Okay, welcome to today's lecture. <coughs> we will continue with parsing and today it will mostly be about bottom-up parsing. You remember that the parser takes the stream of tokens from the scanner and matches that stream against the grammar for the uh, source language, the input language. And uh, <coughs> um, we saw last time how you can build a top-down parser. If you have a grammar, simple one, uh, start symbol S expands to X and Y, uh, while X is a B and Y is, let's say, C, D. So what language does this grammar describe? What are the allowed inputs? Well, you have the start symbol. And you can <coughs> derive the allowed input. The only thing you can do with the start symbol is expand it to x, y. And then you have x, which needs to be expanded to, well, you only have one choice, a, b. And then you have y, which can then be expanded to, well, again, only one choice, a, b, c, d. So the only <coughs> allowed input string of tokens is a, b, c, d. And the parse tree, if you have received a, b, c, d as input, well, these two form an x, or can be reduced to x. These two, c and d, form a y. And all of it forms the x and y forms an s. And if you draw it like you normally draw trees, what you get is S consists of X and Y, X consists of A and B, Y of C and D. And when we did this top down, and you remember that was the easy way to write a parser, then we, well, we know we should start with the start symbol, and we have some input here, A, B, C, D, and we look at A, and what kind of S does that match? Well, we only have one production for S, which is X, Y, so we have to have X, Y, so we build the tree from up, down, like this. Uh, then um, we look at the x. Okay, so again we only have one choice, so it's not much to do to um, 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 choose. So we see that, well, it has to be this one. It's the only choice and also we, um, we check that it actually starts with an a. And then as we want to, the next part of the x is b and y is c and d. And as you see, we built it top down and from the left. If we have a bottom up parser for this simple example, let's do that. I, I delete um, the top down tree and the port, you remember how they look. Now, a bottom-up parser works differently from a top-down parser. Uh, you have a stack where you put things uh, while you're waiting for the rest of the input to uh, help you decide what to do with the, uh, the, the things you have stored away on the stack. So if the input again is A, B, C, D, and we want to build a parse tree for it, then uh, we take the first token in the input and p 
put it on the stack. And this is called shifting. Um, usually when you put things on a stack you call it pushing, but you shift a token from the input to the stack. So the first thing you do is shift. Welcome. Uh, <coughs> you shift and if we look at the stack now, we have no no production, no rule that tells us that we can reduce A to something. We can't do anything with an A, it's just an A. So we take, take the next token, shift that one also to the stack. And now, what do we have on the stack? We have A, B. And look at the grammar. Well, A, B can be interpreted as an X. You can be reduced to an X. So, we uh, remove A and B from the stack and put an X there. So that is called reducing. And these are the two operations you can do. Shift and reduce. One, shift, two, reduce. Now we have an X. We can't do much with a single X, but <coughs> we have some input. So what we have to do now is shift it. So I shift the C on the stack, and I can't do anything with a single C or with X C. So I have to uh, shift again, D. And now the input is finished. And let's look at the stack. Okay, we have, as usual, we look at the top of the stack. We don't do things with things on the bottom here. So ignore X, but look at, well, a single D, we can't do anything, but C and D. That can be reduced to a Y. So remove C and D and put Y there. Two. What we have on the stack now is X and Y. And we have a rule that says that X and Y can be interpreted as an S or rather reduced to S. So let's reduce X and Y to S. And we have reached the start symbol. Now I didn't draw any parse tree here, but let's look at what we did. We uh, <coughs> shifted A and B to the stack, and then we reduced them to an X. So that is the same as building this part of the tree. Then we shifted C and D on the stack and reduced them to a Y. So you see we're building the tree from the bottom up. And when we had X and Y on the stack at the end here, we reduced them to S, which is the same as adding this top node. And the porse tree is finished. So why this type of parsing? Well, <clears throat> you remember that we said that there are a number of constraints you have to put on the grammar to write a top-down parser. Uh, for example, if you have a rule that says x is a b or a c, well, then you have what's called the first conflict. Uh, when you get an A in the input, you don't know which one of these two rules to use. And when we write the parser as a, uh, uh, a program with if statements, then we wouldn't know which uh, branch of the if statement to go into. We could guess one and then have to backtrack, but it's easier if we can uh, decide from, if we know from the start. And we have another problem that says that if 
you ha we have um, uh, two productions like this, that an x can be either x a or c. Well, here we have what we call left recursion. You have x here and x there. And as we saw with the program, then we're not consuming any tokens in the input and we get stuck in an infinite loop in the parser. Both these things the bottom-up parser can handle. So let's see if we have a slightly larger example. I'll raise this very simple example and have an example with a grammar for expressions. Uh, you have three rules. One rule that says that an expression can be one expression plus another expression. And if you remember previous examples, you probably will guess that, okay, we'll have an ambiguous grammar here. Uh, you can also have an expression times an expression, forming a new expression. And an expression can be a single identifier. So we call these rule one, rule two, and rule three. So when we work with the example and reduce, then we can say which rule are we using when reducing. So, some input, x plus y times z. And <coughs> the tokens, well, the tokens we have in the grammar, they are plus, multiplication, and ID, so the token sequence generated is of course ID plus ID times ID. And when the scanner generates these, this token sequence it will uh, add some information here to the ID so we know later uh, in the later phases of the compiler, which, uh, which ID we're talking about. This is X, this is Y, this is Z. But the parser doesn't care about that. The parser only cares about, oh, here comes an identifier. We can show how we can generate this uh, expression. Yes? Yes. Well, the, what, what the grammar says is that an identifier can form an expression. Or rather, that an expression can be, it can be something plus, something minus, but an expression can also be a single identifier. Then, in the input, we, we have many identifiers. Each is an expression that we then add or multiply together. So, let's show, let's show how we <coughs> generate this. Uh, if we have an expression E, uh, we use, well, rule number two, uh, rule two, uh, to uh, generate E times E. And you remember that when, when we try to see the entire language that a grammar describes, then we, use, then we would have used also this possibility that it's E uh, plus E, and that it's a single ID. <coughs> and then this ends, and then we can expand it further. But here, we're only interested in this particular expression, so we're not interested in the entire language. So, rule two gives us expression times expression. 
Uh, <coughs> then we can use rule 3 to uh, expand this uh, expression to a single identifier. Rule 3. So now we have E times an identifier. Then we can take, well, the, we can't expand the ID to anything, but we can expand this expression. And since we have plus here, we can expand it using rule one. That gets E plus E times this identifier. And we're almost finished. We need to expand these two expressions to single identifiers. So we use rule three two times. First to um, Uh, generate e plus id times id and then again to generate uh, id plus id times id. So we see that it's possible to generate this uh, input from uh, e, from the grammar and from the start symbol which in this case is e of course because it's the only non-terminal uh, that we have. Do you see anything wrong with this? Yes. Why did you use two, three, uh, one, three, you can use just once? And say, say again? Uh, rule uh, three. Here? No, not here. In the here. Also, yes. You can use just once and convert E to ID. You mean? Yes, this one. This one. Yes, but I do that here, the next step. I only apply each rule once. So, I mean, obviously, it's, it's, uh, we have three identifiers, so we've used this rule three times. Okay, but is there something wrong with this? Is it ambiguity? Well, yeah, and it's, um, the problem is we could have done this in different ways. What we've done here, you see here that we have an expression times an ID. So, what this means is that we have x plus y times z, which is the wrong, or usually when we work with plus and multiplication, uh, this is not the way we would, do, we would do it. We would group multiplication first because it has higher precedence. But in this case, we have an ambiguous grammar. We don't know the precedence or the priority of plus and multiplication. So anything works. We can do this. Or we could have done it in another way, which would have given us uh, this way of parsing it. And if I draw, draw the parse tree for this, uh, you have E, you have E times E, and since you had plus here, you have E plus e, and then you have down here identifier plus an identifier and times uh, sorry. this is the parse tree when you draw it as a tree. And again, this is not the way we would usually have done it because then we first add these numbers these uh, together and then we multiply. Okay, so <clears throat> will there be some problem for this top-down parser when we try to do this? Uh, correction, with <clears throat> this bottom-up parser. Uh, the top-down parser would have had lots of problems. I mean, each of these productions for expression will start with identifier, so we won't know which one to use. So using a top-down parser of the type we've seen this will not be possible to parse. But let's look how the, the um, top-down parser, uh, the bottom-up parser works. Mm. 
We have uh, the uh, this token sequence. So now uh, I will draw the parse tree above here, so we see how it's created. ID plus ID times ID. This is the same token sequence as there. But now I have space above it to um, draw a tree. And now we have a stack. So the first thing we do, I say steps here. What do we do first? Well, remember, we can shift and we can reduce. And the stack is empty. Reducing meant taking things on the stack and reducing them according to the rules, interpreting things on the stack as one of the non-terminals. But we have nothing on the stack, so the only thing we can do is shift. So we shift the first identifier on the stack. Now, now we have something on the stack that we can reduce. So, um, which rule can we use? Rule number three? Yeah, exactly. It's the only one we can use. We don't have something plus something or something times something on the stack. The only thing we have on the stack is ID. So, we reduce using rule three. So this one is reduced to an expression. Now we have expression on the stack. Uh, we could be finished, but there's more input. So we need to shift. Uh, I shift the plus to the stack. There is no production that says that E plus something can be reduced. So we need to shift more. We shift ID on the stack. And... But there is E plus E. Yes, but we haven't reduced the ID to E yet. So before we can do anything with E plus something, we must apply again rule three to reduce this ID to expression. Rule three again. Now we have E plus E on the stack. And here comes the ambiguity. Should we take this X plus Y and reduce it? So basically we calculate it and then we multiply it with Z. Or should we wait, uh, add times z and then reduce this one. So the result will be x plus the result of, of multiplication. Well, we don't know. We could use both. So now we have a so-called shift-reduce conflict. Shift-reduce conflict. We can either shift or reduce. So which one should we use? Well, let's um, shift, because that will give us the correct uh, uh, priority. But the parser doesn't know this. Uh, it's a conflict. Shift or reduce. So if we shift, we uh, shift the multiplication symbol. And I forgot to move this current place forward. Now we're here. We only have ID left in input. 
And if we look at the stack, there is nothing that, no rule that tells us that e plus e times or e times or just times uh, can uh, match anything. So we need to shift as step seven. And now we have consumed all the input. We put the ID on the stack. And what can we do now? Well, <clears throat> no rule lets us do something with E times ID. The only thing we can do, if we look at the top of the stack or things, uh, one or more items on top of the stack, is to reduce this ID to an expression according to rule three again. So step eight, reduce using rule three. And this ID is reduced to an expression. So we take the ID from the stack and put back expression. Now we have on the stack E plus E times E. We can't go into the stack and do things with things on the bottom, the E plus E. We must use things on the top. So E times E, well, we have a rule for that, rule two. So we can reduce using rule two, which says that an expression times an expression can be interpreted or reduced to an expression. So these two are gone and we put an E on the stack. So now we have E plus E. And which rule can we use now? The first one, yes. We can reduce again using rule one. So E plus E is replaced with E. And now we're finished. And what kind of parse tree does this create? Well, we had uh, each of the IDs were reduced to expressions. So we almost need to do that first. And then we uh, uh, reduced using rule uh, Two. So this expression times this expression became an uh, expression. And then we had rule one that says that expression plus expression. So here we built the tree. So again, bottom up. And as you saw, uh, <coughs> first conflicts were not a problem. Ambiguity are of course still a problem because we don't know which way of parsing this is correct according to, to the grammar because both ways, uh, both plus first or multiplication first, both of them match the grammar. But we could do it, we just got this shift-reduce conflict that tells us that, oh, the grammar is, is uh, ambiguous. We could build two different parse trees. Uh, but left recursion, yeah, that worked also. We had no problem with left recursion because we never get stuck in an infinite loop like we did with the top-down parser. Okay. And this is what's called an LR uh, parser. And the number of tokens we look at is written in within parentheses. Uh, and you remember that this L means tokens from left. And this is how the parse tree is built. And this is a bit complicated. Uh, rightmost derivation in reverse. I'll explain what it means uh, in a second. 
But you remember also the top-down parser. We call it an LL parser, or LL1 if you have one token look you have. Uh, again, the same read tokens from the left. And this uh, <coughs> leftmost derivation, that we build the parse tree from the left. Okay, before we look at this LL and LR, um, try to explain that. Any questions about this example with the um, expressions? Remember, stack, you can shift, you can reduce. And if you have a problem, what one, which one to do, then you have a shift-reduce conflict. And <coughs> uh, parser generators like Bison, uh, generate this type of grammar, so you, uh, this type of parser. So you can have a grammar like this, uh, give it to the generator, uh, to Bison, and it will generate a parser, but it will warn you that there is a shift-reduce conflict because the grammar is ambiguous. Okay? What happens if we uh, if we reduce instead, uh, the question was if we instead of shifting like we did, we had uh, e plus e and then we shifted, we added multiplication here and then it would be expression, then we reduced here. If we instead reduced this one to expression and then shifted in plus identify which is an expression, and then plus. Then we would got, have gotten the parse tree, which, uh, no correction, times. Uh, <clears throat> then we would get, gotten the parse tree that says that id plus id times id. Then we have this one as an expression, and multiplication as an expression. So we would have gotten the other priority, so to speak, of the operators. Sorry for the confusion. Okay? So, <clears throat> depending on if you shift or reduce, you get two different parse trees. And being able to create two different parse trees for the same input, that's the definition of an, in of an ambiguous gram. Okay? The thing with LL and LR, those are terms that are used in, in more theoretical contexts for compilers. But let's go back to this uh, simple grammar we saw at the start. X is, <coughs> can be expanded, oh actually the start symbol, let's, let's do it this way instead. The start symbol can expand to x, y, and x is e, a, b, and y is c, d. Okay? When we did it top down, or I should start by saying, you know how to tra traverse trees, to go through all the nodes in a tree, right? Uh, typically when you do that, you have a tree like this, with a number of nodes. Uh, you can, well you can do it in two different ways. You can do breadth first. So you do this level, then this level, then this level. Or you can do depth first. And that's the easiest way to do it. Uh, you go down the tree and then down the tree, and then down, and so on, from either the left side or the right side. So what I showed here is leftmost uh, depth first traversal of the tree. You can also do rightmost traversal. I mean, if it's, a if it's a binary search tree and you want to go through the nodes in order, you do leftmost depth first. Uh, but you can also do the opposite, go down here and so on. 
that is rightmost traversal. And <clears throat> when we speak about LL and LR, the L and the R stands for left or right. So if I show you um, again, top down or LL. Uh, <clears throat> as you remember, we start with S, then we go down to and build X and Y, and we go down to A and B, and then C and D, because we build the tree from the top down. And the order we go through things is well, we start with the start symbol, then the start symbol can expand to x, y, so we go on to x, then we will match the input a, b, then go up here again and start parsing the y, we match the input that we have, the c and the d. So this was leftmost Traversal. Right? And we're not really traversing the tree or we're building the tree. So we generate the tree or um, we derive the tree, leftmost generation or derivation. When we do it top down, we get this. But when we do it bottom up, L or, well, <clears throat> you remember how it works, we have the stack, we put A on the stack, we put B on the stack, we reduce that to uh, X. Oh, now we're building a parse tree. We have A, B, we reduce them to X. Okay. So we started with the A, we then put B on the stack, then we reduce them to X. So we're building from, uh, from the bottom. Uh, <coughs> then we get C. On the stack, we couldn't reduce that. We need to put D on the stack. So now we have step four and step five. We reduce those. Let me just finish this example. Uh, we reduce these, uh, the C and the D, according to the grammar to a Y. So now we have created a Y. Uh, <coughs> and that was step number six. And then we reduce y and z to s, which is step seven. Now, <clears throat> what's rightmost with this? Well, nothing really, because it's rightmost in reverse. If we look at the way we did it, we started here, went down there, One, no, correction. Uh, I'll draw it in uh, red so you see it better. One, two, three, then four. four, five up there. And if you compare that to rightmost derivation, It's almost right, most derivation, but in reverse. If you reverse, then you go down this way. Rightmost derivation means this, but we did it the other way. 
So the R, R here stands for rightmost derivation in reverse. Okay? So that's why it's called LL and LR. You don't really need to uh, uh, call things LL and LR, but you should, you should recognize the terms when you see them. Uh, LL basically just means top down and LR means bottom up. Okay? Break. Okay, let's uh, continue. with some difficulties with bottom-up parsing. You remember I said that a top-down parser is easier to write. So if we program a parser by hand, we typically do a, a top-down parser. Like the one we saw last time. Or the ones we saw last time. <coughs> uh, but if you have a, a parser generator tool such as Bison, uh, you can let that one generate a uh, bottom-up parser because it uh, puts fewer constraints on how the grammar can be but it's difficult, more difficult to do <coughs> but the tool will do it for you but what is, what is it that makes it difficult to write a bottom-up parser? I mean, <coughs> you still read the tokens from left to right and you don't need these recursive functions and checking first sets and so on. All you need to do is shift or reduce. And when we can reduce, we do that. And when we can shift, we shift. Or rather, when we can't reduce, we shift. So why is it difficult to write a bottom-up parser? Well, let's look at an example. And here we have a grammar. The start symbol S can be expanded either to X, Y or Z, T. And then X is A, B, Y is C, D, Z is E, F, and T, just like Y, is C, D. So, what kind of language or what language does this generate? And is it an ambiguous grammar? You can start suspecting that maybe it's ambiguous because Y and T have the same expansion. C and D can be interpreted both as Y and T. Well, is it ambiguous? Well, let's see. First of all, language. What is the language? Well, we can do as we've done before. Start by the, uh, expanding the start symbol. It can be X, Y or Z, T. If we start with this one, we can expand X to either uh, well, we can only expand x one way, correction. Uh, so you get a, b, y, and then you can expand y to c, d. So a, b, c, d is one possible input that matches this grammar. And down here you have z, t, and you can expand z to um, e, f, followed by t, and then t needs to be expanded to uh, CD, so you can have EFCD, and now you can't get any further. So you have two possible allowed input strings to this parser ABCD and EFCD. And it doesn't matter in which order you do the expansion of X and Y or Z and T because you get the same results. But let's look specifically at these two things. Okay, I have, uh, let's say I have the input A, B, C, D. Well, should C, D be interpreted as uh, T or as Y? We have two possibilities. But will that ever be a problem? Well, if I look at, I want to generate the start symbol. Uh, I want to reduce this to the start symbol. I have a, b, and the only thing that a, b matches is x. And c, d. Well, it could be, I could try to reduce it to y, 
or I could try to reduce it to t. If we start with t, I try to reduce it to t. Do I have any rule that can reduce xt? No. But if I had chosen instead to uh, interpret it as uh, y, well, then I have a rule xy that can be reduced to the start symbol. So this is the right one. Uh, I have two possibilities here, but only one will allow me to build the parse tree. So just that you have two non-terminals that expand to the same thing here does not mean that it's an ambiguous grammar. But let's um, uh, see what happens when we do bottom-up parsing with this. Bottom-up parsing. Well, <coughs> we have this input A, B, C, D. We have our stack. So we take A and, well, there's nothing on the stack, so we must shift. Uh, we have no rule that lets us reduce a single A to something, so we must shift B. And now we have A and B on the stack, so we can reduce that to what? X. X. And a single X won't let us do anything, so we need to shift C. There is no rule that says X, C, so we can't sh reduce now, so we need to shift D, C, D. And the input is finished, and now let's see what we can do. Well, we can reduce D, C and D to something. We can reduce it to either Y or T. Y or T. And which one is the right one? Well, as we saw, we have to reduce to y. Otherwise, we will not be able to uh, reduce further with the stuff that's already uh, below this on the stack. So what I'm saying now is that to decide which production to use to reduce CD, it's not enough to just look at CD. You need to look at what is below on the stack. Actually, you need to look at everything that's below on the stack, because you can have complex rules here <coughs> in several levels. So it's not just reduce according to the grammar, because you need to choose the right production, the right, right reduction. And to go through everything that's on the stack below this thing you want to reduce, and check which possibilities uh, will let you build a complete parse tree. Uh, that's a difficult problem. You could do it like, okay, try every possible parse tree and try to find... Uh, that would be really um, slow. So, uh, real bottom-up parsers build tables that let you check, okay, if it's this, then we can reduce like this, uh, use this one. Uh, and that is the difficult part with bottom-up parsers. Looking at what's on the stack and <coughs> letting that decide which uh, reductions are possible to use. Okay? Can we do a top-down parser for this? Well, a top-down parser, when it gets the input A, B, C, D, it would build, say, S, and then we would need to look at first sets. You remember uh, <coughs> the first, what can an X, Y start with? Well, that's the same that what an X can start with, so it can only start with A. Uh, the other uh, possibility you have is Z, T. So the first set for z, t, what can a z, t start with? Well, it's the same as z, so it must be an e. So when you see an a in the input, 
you know that, oh, it's this one that matches. So we need to expand x, y. And then uh, <coughs> x can only expand to a, b. So we check that it's an a, it was. We check it's a b, it was. And then we need to match a y. And a y can only expand to c and to d. And here we have no problem. So in this particular case, it was easier to do, well, it's always easier to do top-down parsing, but it, it works, uh, I would say, better than this one where you have to look at stuff on the stack. Okay? Uh, no, yeah? Just kind of bit, uh, this one first. Yes, uh, yes, this one. This one? Yes. The first set. What can... I mean, the right-hand side of this production is x, y. So what to which tokens can x, y start with? That is the first set. So the first set of x, y is what can x, y start with? And since x, uh, since x, y starts with x, you need to look at what x can start with. And the only thing that an x can start with is a. And in the same way, z, t. The only thing a Z can start with is an E, so the first set for that is E. And we see here that, oh, it is an A, so we know which rule it is that we must use. Okay? Uh, we had shift reduce conflicts, which usually dip, uh, is caused by an ambiguous grammar. But we also can have reduce-reduce conflicts. And <clears throat> what we lo just looked at when we could reduce... Uh, now I erased the example so I don't remember what it was, but uh, you had two uh, tokens on top of the stack. C and D, maybe. And you could reduce it either to, well, to two different uh, non-terminals. But that is not a reduce-reduce conflict, because depending on what you had on the stack already, <coughs> only one of them was possible, if you want to build a parse tree. But a reduce-reduce conflict, that is, when you have an ambiguous grammar, and you don't get a shift-reduce conflict, but you get a reduce-reduce conflict instead, two possible reductions that you can do. So. Simplest, simplest example. An expression can be an ID, or it can be a term. A term, then, is always an ID. Okay? And then you have input ID. So, what is the parse tree you build for that ID? Well, either you can use ID directly here and say that it's an expression. Or if I take the same input again, I can start by saying that this ID is a term, and then the term is an expression. So I get two different parse trees for the same input. Should this identifier be interpreted as a term, which is then an expression, or should it be interpreted directly as an expression? And if we do the same thing we've seen before, we have a stack, we put ID on it. <coughs> well, we can either reduce this one to expression, or if we do the same again, we can reduce it to term, and then that term would be reduced to expression. So here we have two possible reductions we can do. We don't know which one is true, because the grammar is ambiguous. Both are valid. So why would anyone do something stupid like this? Well, maybe a um, reasonable example is... Um, I mean, in mathematics you want to do things like x raised to the power of y. And you want also to use subscripts like x1. And if you have x1 and want to square it, you want to put the one and the two above each other like this. 
I mean, you could do x1 and then square it. But in, in your typeset mathematics formulas, this does not look as good as this one. So you don't want to use this one, but you want to use this one. And if we have a simple typesetting language, uh, let's say you have the keywords soup for superscript and sub for subscript. So you can write, for example, uh, x soup y, which would then be typeset as x y. And you can do uh, x sub 1, which gets you uh, x. No, yeah, yeah correct. So. so you have some rules in your grammar for this language. You say that text, the input in your program, can be some text with a superscript, which is another text. Because you can do things like uh, x uh, raised to the power x plus y. So you can have more complicated text than just a single uh, variable. Uh, and you have the same rule for subscripts. Sub. But then you add another rule, because if you only have these two rules, and you do x sub 1 sub 2, this would be tra translated to x1 and then square it. This is the ugly result you don't want. You want the one and the two above each other. So you add a specific rule for this case. If you have text, sub, text, and then soup, text for superscript, well, then, if you, for example, have this thing up here, x sub 1 soup 2, you want to parse it as one unit. But now we see we have this reduce-reduce conflict. If I have this input text here, x sub 1, soup 2. Well, I could parse it as first using this rule and then this text uh, using that rule. But this gives this ugly result. But instead I could use my special rule here and do it all as one. So I have x uh, I use this one. But the, the grammar is ambiguous. You can use both. Both are valid, valid interpretations. So this is perhaps a better example for, for a reduce-reduce conflict. Because if we look at the input, you put it on the stack. OK, x sub 1. Oh, actually, I have um, moved it. It should be this part. This is the way it's supposed to be. Uh, this one. Uh, and this is the this I would have to do first. So I can do either reduce just this part, or I can reduce all of it at once. Okay? Reduce, reduce conflict. Thomas, yes? You said that uh, the bottom up passing look at the whole stack yes. uh, before, so will it uh, not solve this problem for you? No, because when I look at the stack, I, have, I can either 
I can build a, a, a complete parse tree either by reducing this first or by reducing all of it. Because when I reduce this, it's text, and then I can uh, reduce uh, this sub and this text. So it's, it's two possible ways of, I mean, the grammar is ambiguous, so the parser can't really solve it for us. So to solve this problem, we will uh, uh, I will need, the grammar? Well, I need to either rewrite the grammar or say that, okay, this rule has priority, which is a way of re rewriting the grammar. Hmm? Okay, so remember, when your parse, parser generator like Bison tells you you have a shift-reduce conflict or a reduce-reduce conflict, then you have most likely made a, an ambiguous grammar. So fix that ambiguity. Yeah, let's say something more about left factoring. You remember last time we talked about grammars of the type, you have an S which can be either X, Y or X, Z. And to simplify, uh, we can say that X and Y or X, A, B, C. So this grammar could be rewritten instead of this grammar, I can just say that S is either X is A and Y is B, so it's either A, B or A, C. Then I have a simple grammar for the same language. And if I have some input and it starts with an A, well, then I don't know if it's this rule or this rule I need to use. So we had a first conflict. Uh, we can left factor. We see that, okay, both start with an S. Uh, correction, S always starts with an A. So it's A and then some stuff. You can call it a rest. And that rest is either B or C. Now, you don't have a first conflict. You can write a top-down parser for this. Uh, S always starts by matching an A, because the input must start with an A, and then you check is it B or is it C. Well, depending on if it's B or C, you match either the B or the C. So then it suddenly works for a top-down parser, because you have left factored it. But can you always left factor when you have a first conflict? Can left factoring solve first conflicts? Well, uh, <clears throat> sometimes it can. I mean, in this case, it solved the first conflict. Yes, nice. But let's take a more advanced example. Let's say we have. Uh, a grammar for a C-like language that says that an, uh, a statement can be either a uh, either an assignment or an expression. And if you look at assignment. It always starts with an identifier and an equal sign. And then comes uh, an expression. While an expression can be a lot of things. It can be a number, which is a token. It can be an identifier. And it can be a left parenthesis followed by many things. So, an expression is a, a normal expression. So, what is the first conflict here? What is the first conflict? The ID. The ID, yes. Because 
if I have input to my program that starts with an identifier, it starts with X. Well, is it the start of an assignment or the start of an expression? I don't know, because if the next token is equals 3, if the next token is equals, well, assuming you can't have uh, <coughs> equal signs inside expressions, uh, then it's the start of an assignment. And if it's instead plus something, then it's the start of an expression. Here, you could uh, <coughs> left factor. You could, maybe, this is not a smart thing to do, say that a statement can start with id, and then comes the rest, and the rest is either assignment followed by expression, or it is a strange type of expression that doesn't start with an id. It's, um, it's an expression, except you have skipped the first identifier. Um, difficult, but possible to do. But, will this solve the problem? No, because if you remember how C works, you can use the value of an assignment as a value. So I can do things like this. If, uh, no if, but put 3 inside x, and then the same 3 that you put inside x, you also put in y. Because this expression has the value 3. And you can see that in things like while uh, c, let me get sure, is not end of file, do something. This means read characters from the standard input until you find the end of file character. And here, this is an assignment, of course, but it also has a value. If you combine this with, let's say, arrays and array indexing, I can write things like a x equals 3 equals something. So you can put an assignment inside the uh, array indexing uh, brackets. And what is the problem with this? Well, now let me uh, <coughs> show some problems here. First of all, if you have an expression that starts like this, is this the beginning of an assignment or an expression? Well, again, you don't know. The next token might be assignment, or the next token might be plus, or some other uh, normal operator. So, if I look at this input, I don't know if I have the beginning of an expression or of an assignment. And how do we left factor this? That would be really difficult. And also, it <coughs> doesn't help to have more than one tokens look ahead. I mean, when I had this problem, I could solve it by just having more than one tokens look ahead. If I look at the next token, so I have two tokens look ahead. So we have an LL2 language. Well, that would solve that problem. But it won't solve this one. Because, of course, this one can be arbitrarily long. I can have a thousand tokens, a million tokens. So I would need a million token look ahead to see if then equals or plus comes. Plus, again, <coughs> let's say I have Well, I don't know if this is the start of, somewhere over here, we will have 
either plus or equals. So this is either an assignment or an expression. But this one, this can also be an assignment or an expression. So here might come either equals 3 or plus 3. So if it's equals 3, then I put the number 3 in position 3 in the array x. And then I use that value as uh, uh, indexing the array a. Or it's plus 3, so take uh, position 3 in the, value in, in the array x, add 3, and use that as the value. So here I have two, possible, two places where I don't know what I'm doing. Is it an assignment or an expression? So it's not even possible to solve this by uh, trying one and then backtracking once. You may need to try it once. Is it this one or that one? And then here you need to try either this one or that one. So you can have an arbitrarily large number of places where you need to make a decision. Is it an assignment or an expression? So you get, what do you do? Well, to be able to backtrack, you would need to build a stack. Here on the stack, first I have this place where I don't know which one to use. So I try one and then the next one is this one. So I could build a tree of possibilities. And then when I've chosen, I get here and chose wrong, then I go back here using the stack, going back to the previous level. And this is sort of what the bottom-up parser does. It has this stack. This is the stack that the bottom-up parser uses. So the, the uh, bottom-up parser puts things on the stack that it doesn't know how to reduce. It doesn't know if this is an assignment or an expression, so it just puts everything on the stack until later, when it later gets either this one this assignment token or this plus token, and then it can reduce. So we see here one of the reasons that top-down parsers have difficulties with some grammars while bottom-up parsers don't. If we don't know how to parse something, just dump everything on the stack and wait until later. The top-down parser, at least if you have this type of recursive descent parser that we've uh, uh, seen before, then you need to know which part of the if statement to go into. But here, put it on the stack and decide later. Okay? Luckily for you, you will not have to write an actual bottom-up parser. Uh, you will work with top-down parsers and write top-down parsers. That was the simple type, you know. You know. Uh, <coughs> but when it comes to bottom-up parsers, you just feed your grammar to Bison, which generates the parser for you. So in that way, it's much easier to use a bottom-up parser because a tool can create it for you. Okay, any questions? Well, I'm sure, I'm sure you will have some questions later, but maybe not right now. Okay, thank you for today. Let's uh, finish a few minutes early. Thank you.